Just a reminder, it's now an opportunity to draw some of the themes of this session together, which we've called the culture industry. A sort of diverse and fascinating range of ideas and modes of production here um, within a kind of spatial context, but also all sorts of sensory contexts. But uh, just before you um, ask your questions, wait until the microphone reaches you. So can I uh, see a show of hands for questions? We have somebody down the front here, Jess, just in front of me. Hi, I've got a question for Singh. So briefly, uh, regarding the Chapel of Versailles, have you come across materials related to acoustics and, of course, the king's preference for certain types of compositions and sounds as related to architectural space? So in terms of um, compositions, not being a, a musicologist, I, I won't um, comment necessarily on that, but he definitely had his... Um, tastes. He preferred the low mass with a grand motet, petit motet. Um, so it was a generally enjoyable experience for the king to go to mass air every day. In terms of acoustics, there's lots and lots of documentation from the time, uh, particularly a little bit later, not necessarily with Versailles, but with other things such as the Conso Spirituel, about the acoustics and the positioning of instruments within the spaces for those concerts. Um, so there was some um, type of uh, discussion about that. I know that with the Royal Chapel there is a, a critique about the quality of the acoustics and it's a problematic space. Uh, I didn't go into exactly what those issues were um, for the musicians. I believe it would probably be uh, the individual positions of musicians in the Tribune in relation to hearing each other but also in relation to its reception either in the nave or uh, for the king in the tribune. I think what, what is most uh, remarkable in a way about Versailles is the flexibility, right? That a chapel is used for all sorts of things. Um, um, it, is, it is not necessarily just there for, for religious uh, celebrations, uh, for music concerts and so on. And of course the same can be said for the garden, right? I mean the gardens, we know of the many festivities. It's fantastic to see the prints here. Um, of the different, um, you, you showed some of them, the different pavilions constructed and so on. And I think the, the Muni Plaisir and the, the money and the effort that went into all of this very, you know, temporary um, stuff is, is rather remarkable. And I think that's in a way where, yeah, where many of, of us and, and the, the people we study um, come together and, and construct or perform um, a space and really perform a space rather than perform in a space um, for for the pleasure and the and the the propaganda I'd say um, mm -hmm. of the king. And I think uh, just following on from what was mentioned today in in Wolf's talk was about uh, we also need to think that the people participating were not passive uh, receptors of a performance, but the act of being there in itself, you were complicit in the performance itself. And I think that's part of, uh, I guess, 17th century performative theory, is that it re also required the engagement of the audience as, I guess, a, an actor in a different type of stage within those types of environments. And I think the, the porcelain um, setting as well was very fascinating for me to um, rethink about that. I've seen the plans uh, before out, out of the book, but actually putting it now to the, the designs of the, the actual um, service wear it makes it seem even more incredible uh, when they were positioned in the, in the gardens or on large tables. Uh, 
and then the music performed and you even said, were they even eaten off or just displayed? That yes, the, the notion of function is important with a lot of that uh, exceedingly richly decorated porcelain, but that its use was probably quite rare. We look at something like the, the, the Louis XVI uh, service, that service which is, um, was destined to be completed in about 1803, so of course Louis um, never saw the, uh, the completion of that project, but it's what was produced survives in the royal collection that I mean we have plates uh, with far less rich decoration uh, this is rich mythological decoration uh, across the uh, the components of this service but plates with far less rich decoration which were the plates actually intended for um, eating off that the the far the those with the extremely rich decoration which would be damaged by the use of cutlery of course, uh, were intended primarily uh, for display. It's not to say that they were never used, but uh, actual use was not not the point. It was the potential use uh, that uh, made the point for their existence. Yeah, I think there was an almost theatrical um, exchange of plates, actually, so that you would have the, the decoration would sit uh, down at a richly decorated, you know, the first um, set of plates, if you like, and then with the food chain, um, plates would be exchanged so that the, the, the highly decorative ones would only sit there like a, like a picture or table decoration. They would be swapped for the one, uh, for the, or the, the, the many more simpler ones for the meal. Right, I also wanted to say something about the, the porcelain and um, one of the, um, the um, uh, events that people would flock to uh, to uh, participate at, um, and, and watch were, were the Grand Souper, uh, the public dining of the king, which originally took place very often, almost daily, or several times a week, and, and during the 18th century less and less with the, um, the desire of Louis XV and Louis XVI of being having a more private life but yet if you were lucky enough as a visitor to Versailles you would be able to witness this public dining and indeed rather than eating from porcelain it were the precious metal um, plates and services that were being used um, what do we know though when in terms of the um, the annual sales of SAF uh, that took place um, just before Christmas uh, at Versailles, uh, and I think it was at that occasion that Madame de Pompadour said, uh, not buying SAF, is, you're not a good citizen of France, or something like that, because you were so, it was almost you were forced to buy something at those annual um, displays. But do you have any idea how much SAF was sold at those occasions, those... Um, those uh, uh, sales in December? Off the top of my head. Uh, no, but that, uh, the, um, they're well documented, uh, those sales. Uh, so where the court courtiers were invited to uh, view the display of the, the factory's most recent uh, production, usually presented by the king uh, himself, it would be present at the, at the displays. And so there was an expectation from the, uh, that the courtiers would uh, purchase. Sometimes extensive sets were purchased, sometimes a, a token, a gesture was made, small uh, a, a tea service or a, uh, some of the largest serving pieces like tureens and things like that were actually made as individual objects, not necessarily parts of, uh, of grand services and things like that would be um, uh, purchased. But certainly, Certainly there was an expectation um, that uh, as a grand courtier one would uh, acquire uh, this, uh, this material. Um, but of course it's, I think the, the important, for me the important point is that this factory despite the conduct of sales, um, the, 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 the model of some sort of retail economic um, uh, playing out there is illusory, uh, that the factory 
could not support itself through its sales. It was dependent upon constant financial support uh, from the Crown. And then when one thinks that so many of the courtiers that are buying the porcelain, I mean, much of their income is dependent on the largesse of the Crown as well. There is money that is recycling itself through the system. Um, what, is, uh, what is important is the presence of this material which is created through the patronage and at the command of the monarch. I think the material itself is speaking of the power of the monarch. And therefore, as a courtier, if you wish to participate, uh, share in the, in the, in, in the glory uh, of, of the king, then sh sharing in the glory of the products of this extraordinary manufactory was, was a part of that expectation. Uh, it was, it no, well not not in not in its heyday. Um, uh, of course, you know, I mean, the history of Meissen is fractured by you know sort of 1751, the occupation of the factory by uh, Frederick the Great of Prussia, and the forced deportation of the factory staff to to Berlin. And I mean, it takes a long time for the factory to to recover, and it does attempt to establish itself on a more economic uh, basis, so retail basis at that point. But no, it was completely dependent on uh, the support of the, the Crown. And that's a factory where, of course, we talk about dinner services. I mean, Seb, the grand service of Seb are wonderful, but dinner services, we need to go to Meissen. The great services, you know, over 700 works in the cameo service, well, that's very nice, but, you know, the 2,200 pieces in the Swan service rather tops that slightly. Um, this was the factory that produced grand services. But these were exclusively the prerogative of the, of the electoral court, the elector himself or the prime minister. One couldn't just go and order a service. Um, they were produced at the largesse of the, of the, the state. A, a very, a very important. I mean, of course, once Meissen is established, uh, Augustus the Strong has the great trump card. He is the only prince in Europe who can produce true porcelain, and so becomes the representative material of the Saxon state. So extensive diplomatic gifts. Um, there's a wonderful publication, the, the um, Fragile Diplomacy, which was an equally wonderful exhibition curated by Maureen Cassidy Geiger in 2000. Eight, nine, I, I think, which explores this this issue, the role of uh, Meissen porcelain, um, its function in Saxon diplomacy um, extensively. It functioned in the same way for the French factory as well. The majority of bronze service commissioned by the king uh, were given away as diplomatic gifts. What, was Catherine uh, the Great the only... Uh is a king or queen uh, to, uh, bo to have a service uh, done by the self manufacturer or uh, do, uh, do you, did the other king uh, order the, uh, a service as well? So um, was it uh, internationally, uh, I guess the reputation of the yes. self manufacturer was so big, so good, so great, that yes. Catherine the Great, uh, the Russian uh, um, empress, yes. no. uh, bo bo asked to have one. Was she the only example no. uh, across Europe? No, no, no. Uh, by the 17th, by the, the 1760s, Sev has established itself as the preeminent or the most desirable porcelain uh, to be had in Europe. And of course, Catherine, the cameo service is, is actually commissioned not for Catherine herself, but for her lover, Grigory Potemkin. Um, but Catherine demanded the best of the best. She you know, vacuums up great mm. painting collections, great collections around Europe. And if she was going to acquire porcelain, it had to be uh, the best sieve or other ceramics, Wedgwood, the most technically innovative ceramic manufacturers of the late 18th century. Other, yes, no, other, other crowned heads are commissioning services or are being gifted services as well. I mean, there are, the gifting of services is perhaps even more important and sees the dissemination of Sev more widely than, than purpose commissions. So maybe economically, that was just to start, and maybe without the French Revolution, it could have the, taken off. The or ordering of services, um, you know, the 777 pieces of the cameo service, uh, it took 
2,000 pieces were fired to get the 777 perfect pieces. So it was an exceedingly expensive service, so expensive that I think in the end it took, I mean, Catherine paid it off over 30 years or something. So it's cash flow issues would remain a, a problem for the factory no matter how frequently they sold. On, on that note, um, I think it's a wonderful time for us to stop and to thank um, the speakers in this session. It's been really terrific. And